Um, it's always a pleasure to be here. This is a really interesting conference to me because the range of speakers is always fascinating. So I hope I can continue that trend here today. Before we start today, I wanted to explain a couple of things about who we are and what we do. Um, the Emerging Trends Report only writes about long-term investment trends. They have to run for a minimum of 15 years, and they were all anomaly-based. We were founded in 2004, started publishing in late 2004, and chronologically since that time, we've written about coal, gold, water and food, nuclear energy, um, I've got two microphones, um, nuclear energy, silver, scrap metals and specialty metals and recycling, the American and North American electrical grid, transportation fuels, and shale, oil, horizontal drilling and fracking. So I'm coming to you from a, a, an unusual position and then a lot of the people that we've had speak up here were stealing my material. So I was frantically last night reshaping this. So this has been considerably rewritten for this. But one of the things that, and why I'm in Australia, is because when we wrote the scrap metal recycling and specialty metal report, one of the things that became apparent was that a whole bunch of our other trends intersected specialty metals. So 2009, we were actually, I have to point out that we were about to release our 10th report uh, in September of 2008. We are still waiting to release that report, but the time is getting close and that report is actually on a renaissance in American manufacturing. Now this is gonna be one of the things we're gonna come back to today. This was going, was already building steam in 2005 was when it first came to our attention. It's been building a lot of momentum. The cheap input from shale gas has really accelerated it. But it's very important to remember that the American, all of the American infrastructure, and I've got some astounding figures for you, all of the American infrastructure is past its use by date. This is why we have uh, natural gas distribution lines blowing up in San Bruno, California last year and killing eight people and burning up 38 houses and putting 50 people in the hospital. Politicians have been loath to raise the idea of raising taxes for infrastructure. So we have some extraordinary demand coming. And all of these projects are gonna be very steel intensive and all of this stuff is leveraged to specialty metals in one way or another. Now we'll hear more about that when we go on. But I've learned that the best thing to do here is to start with this. Any geologist in the room cannot answer this question. Anyone who is not a geologist, tell me what's the difference between these two sets of metals. Anyone? No. The answer is, up to and including number 26, iron, they're created in our solar system. All those other metals come from, are the products of supernovae. They're literally stardust. Now, this is the geology for liberal artists because I can do a 20 year geology course in three slides, okay? We have a very short attention span and big imaginations. What happens here, you know, think about it. Everything above atomic number 26 has to have, well, you can read it up here yourself, you guys, you guys are big. It can't be formed by fusion, by nuclear fusion. It has to have neutrons and protons absorbed to it by unfathomable, we can't even imagine the pressure is necessary and the temperature is necessary to do that. But it happens at the end of the life of every star. When a star goes supernova, this happens automatically. It's massive, we, we, we can't even, there are not words to describe the size and scope of these explosions. They're so big and they're so far away that this one was found 400 years ago. We're still seeing pictures of it. It's that far away, it's that long ago. And what happens is all of this interstellar material, ash, you can call it ash, dust, whatever, is created and dispersed in an interstellar cloud. Our solar system forms by the condensation and concentration of these things. The sun, our sun, picks up 99% of it, gets lit off, and all the rest of it is floating around our solar system, gradually forms planets and whatnot. Uh, here's another, there's a quick one for you. 
Okay, Colli oh, they can't read it all. Um, collisions and stuff, gets to the, get down the bottom is the important thing here. The material remaining outside the sun has undergone one or more of the following processes. You've got oxidation, accretion, melting, segregation, and fractional crystallation. And what happens next? It bubbles up to the surface in this endless cycle, these whole different kinds of transportation mechanisms that in the process of, of transporting these chemical compounds to the surface and then subducting them again up and down, over time they get concentrated, over a lot of time. They're not making any more of these. So what happens is that as these compounds congregate into essentially ore bodies, a few of them, very few of them, are economic to mine. But the probability of any of these elements with a number over 26 or higher forming in itself is infinitesimal. I mean, the, the, they have more decimals on it you can shake a stick at. That's why they're so scarce, and this is why they are so precious to us. You cannot understand any of this stuff if you don't get this. You're never going to find you're never going to find the concentrations of these, these metals. Where to go again? Well, I'll go back here first. Wrong way, sorry. You're never going to find any of the concentrations in these blue metals that you will of the brown. There's, they aren't out there. In fact, they get more and more sparse the further down the list you go until you get to a couple of there that are man-made. So we'll get back to here. So the USGS put out this really neat chart. I hope you take a second to look at it. It's a little confusing to look at. I was surprised they got away with putting it out. But it's talking about the relative abundance of these metals. We got, obviously, the rock forming groups. Get down to the rare earths. And right below the rare earths, they're rare metals. Notice that the rare earths are not rare. They're heavy, right? Scale is left to right heavy. Vertical is, is concentration or, or particles. Notice that they are not, they're not that scarce, but they're quite heavy. And then below them are the rarest of these metals. One of the great party question guys is uh, tellurium is almost as, as almost as rare as platinum. And it's purely a byproduct. Anyway, so this gives you an idea of, of where things sit on this. So what we did through the strangest of coincidences, we were called up and asked to do some, some research on a, on a specialty metal. And we didn't know anything about it, and that was the best qualification. They wanted somebody that knew nothing about it, so that we would take a look at it with fresh eyes. And I'll tell you that story in a minute. But what, because of all the NDAs and everything I signed, this was with BAS of Engelhardt, and there's another one with uh, the Adit Funds, uh, what came out was a list of these metals that are suffering from significant supply threats. Not just one supply threat, like it's scarce, like we're talking about all of them are scarce, or um, not just nationalization, but we came up with five categories that we use. We use sovereign risk, which as you know is the number one risk to the mining industry right now. Scarcity, we've already talked about. No substitute in the primary application. Um, platinum and reforming cat uh, catalysts is one. Uh, what's another good one? Um, tungsten, you can't make cutting tools without tungsten. Things like that. Byproduct. Interestingly, almost all of these metals are byproduct. There's not that many economic concentrations. So, for example, cobalt is usually a byproduct of nickel, or often today gold is a byproduct of copper. Uh, tellurium is always a byproduct of, of copper. Um, silver, byproduct of uh, lead and zinc. The list just goes on forever. But the important issue about whether or not a metal is mined primarily for its own value or whether it is a byproduct is that unless the value of the primary metal is going up, it will not be mined. Mine increase will not, mine production will not increase. This is obviously supply inelasticity. Supply inelasticity is consistent for almost all of these metals. Um, and the last one is a dissipative use. Now you can see there's three red there that we have no control over whatsoever. We don't have anything to say about that. But these other two, nationalization risk and dissipative use, we do have some say on. And the, where our say as investors comes 
is where we put our investment dollars, what projects we fund. Now, I would submit to you that anybody who believes in a, a sustainable economy or a sustainable planet that does not recycle metals has a very serious disconnect from reality. The beautiful thing about metals is that they are infinitely recyclable. And to do so is cheaper than it is to mine fresh ore, process it, and produce it. But we don't. We're lazy. We want the latest, greatest. But these stars are literally, and we're talking Cosby, Stills, and Nash here, guys. This is stardust. We're pissing it away. So we'll, we're going to come back to that in a second. Now, a quick run through of this. Some of, you guys have, some of these guys are old friends. I've seen these presentations before, so I'll go through this really quickly. <sighs> the endless pursuit of higher quality, ever more efficient devices at ever lower prices is the definition of capitalism. Everybody wants the latest, greatest thing. The price on all technology always goes down. Good example of that, cell phones, laptop computers, desktops. They're talking now about people won't be making desktop computers in five years. One of the key drivers of this, and one that I harp on all the time, is that the technology industry in and of itself has created the drivers that we are seeing now for the use of these metals. Now, that's a very important thing to remember. In the early 90s, we had an explosion in computer processing power. Mid to late 90s, we had an explosion in analytical and modeling software. And then starting in 2003, we had an explosion in hard disk drive capacity. And all of these were occurring at literally plummeting costs. You can buy two terabyte hard drive now for $79. It's, you know, <laughs> and these things are possible because of the magic qualities of these specialty metals. It's, it's literally magic. They put these things together in a, in a magic soup, and they can change the performance characteristics of these metals. I am uh, having more luck with my five-year-old daughter right now than I am with my 12-year-old and nine-year-old sons, but I'm trying to steer them into metallurgy and material science, because those are the two drivers for all this technological innovation that we're seeing. It is not, it has not been. You know, we just, uh, what's his name? Zuckerberg's IPO just went off. Those days are long gone when it comes to technology. Software, that's still, you still might get kids in garages doing neat stuff. But right now, the stuff you're seeing in your iPhone, the stuff you're seeing in your iPad, the stuff you're seeing on you know, phase change memory devices, you know, they're gonna be, that's the next, uh, I think I, I here. This is old hat, your USB stick, your flash memory. Next generation is called phase change memory. It's Gallium, tellurium, and antimony on a silicon base. What it does, it can never fail because it literally changes phase. When you write something and save it, it gets locked in. So if your power cuts off, you break it, it's still there. That's what's going to replace this. You also get incredible densities on a very small space. These are the things that are coming at us. And they're coming faster as a product of metallurgy and material science. These are very, very big, very, very well-funded laboratories. I mean, billion-dollar budgets. They're all over. Japan is big in it. Europe is big in it. The United States is big in it. The big players in it right now are the guys like Horaeus, uh, Johnson Matthey, Umicore. They are doing some of the most sophisticated chemistry on an industrial scale that man has ever done. The very good investments, nobody pays any attention to them. Anyway, so the next thing, on, I'll come back to this in a second. Um, I just covered scarcity and byproduct sourcing, um, dissipative use, recycling I mentioned. I would like everyone to, if you take nothing else away from what I'm telling you, I would like you to remember this. By and large, specialty metal demand is not GDP correlated. It's not. It is purely discovery driven. These guys come up with these really cool ideas. They say, I need this metal. They don't even say how much or what purity. They said, we need this. 
and they start ordering it, ordering it like crazy. Now, I always, I always use this as the example, mostly because it got me interested to start with, and I, I follow it because it's just fascinating to me. It's fascinating to me. Ruthenium is the, well, I guess it's not the, it used to be the minor platinum group metal. When they went into a, a deposit in South Africa and they started processing it, you know, they were taking out the nickel and they were taking out the gold and the platinum and the palladium and the rhodium, you know, and it's getting kind of scarce in there. So finally they're getting down to the osmium and the iridium. And when they got all done, they had some smoke. And that smoke was ruthenium. It was so unimportant for so long, the South Africans didn't even track how much they produced. Some years they didn't produce any. We still don't know how much they have because they just keep selling into the market every time the price takes off. But what happened in, this, in the sense of hard drives here, which is fascinating, was that this guy who was working for Hitachi read a paper, and this paper changed the world. If you see on here, the first thing on the list that they used uh, ruthenium for as a great stabilizer was third and fourth generation super alloys. Now these super alloys are nickel, cobalt, vanadium, tungsten, molybdenum, rhenium, and now ruthenium. But what they found was that when you put this soup of metals together, you could take these temperatures, and used mostly in jet turbines and power plant turbines, up to extreme temperatures, very, very high temperatures. And going to such an extreme temperature meant you got a more complete fuel burn and you produced less, less pollution. It improved the economics through temperature. The problem was the magic ingredient for third generation super alloys was rhenium. And if you remember that chart before, rhenium is one of those metals down there with the uh, very rare with the platinum group metals and tellurium. <clears throat> and and tellurium. So what happened was they found out that if you put rhenium in this soup, you could raise your operating temperatures, and you could raise them and raise them and raise them. They went through a whole bunch of, of iterations until they reached a point where they had so much rhenium in it, the whole alloy was becoming unstable. And they thought that was the end of the road. And somebody else came up with this idea, well, hold on. Let's just try some other metals. There's got to be something we can put in that, in that soup to balance out the instability of the rhenium. And lo and behold, they found that ruthenium did it. So by adding, ruthenium plays no structural role in that alloy other than to calm down or stabilize the rhenium. And in so doing, they got the next step change in temperature, operating temperatures out of these things. Now this is, this is a very critical thing because in the airline industry, and I'm going to come back to another story about the airline industry in a second. In the airline industry, one or 2% weight savings or one or 2% improvement in your fuel economy is the stuff guys retire on. This is big time. So this guy at Hitachi, for whatever reason, you know, he's probably an engineer who knows why they think the way they do, um, read about this and he said, well, hold on. We've known that we can, we can we've known and the, that the current methodology is that we stacked all of our bits horizontally or longitudinally. And that was the guiding limit on how much data we could put on a hard drive. They've known since the 60s that you could stack it vertically, but it created two problems. It became unstable, and it couldn't take that much magnetism in that dense of place. So this Hitachi guy said, well, hold on. This platter has got like 12 metals on it, and lo and behold, guess what? It's got a little bit of platinum, a little bit of vanadium. You know, three or four of these metals were also on that platter on a hard drive. And he said, well, it worked on turbines. Let's try it on hard drives. And lo and behold, switching to vertical or perpendicular bit stacking is how we have this improvement. That's an exponential logarithmic growth in hard disk strata. I mean, think about it. 1999, I remember a two gigabyte hard drive was almost $1,000. Now you can get two terabytes for 79 bucks. This is extraordinary and it was all enabled by ruthenium now but all these metals they can do all these weird things with you would never have thought of now you can see you can see the, the corollary or the relationship between super alloys for you know stabilizing this alloy soup 
and for a hard disk drive, which is kind of the same thing, all these layers of metals on a platter. But then they started looking at it, and one of the really trippy things about ruthenium is your body thinks it's iron. So now what they're doing is they're making nanotech lattices out of ruthenium, and they are hanging extraordinarily toxic but very small doses of cancer treatment on it. They inject it near the cancer. The cancer is like a black hole that sucks everything up around it. The ruthenium bearing the toxic uh, treatment gets sucked into the cancer. The change in temperature sets it off. The cancer, the treatment is released, voila. This is going to be a very, very big thing. They also use ruthenium in artificial photosynthesis. Anybody who follows the solar industry know that the Europeans have been on this for years, and they can't quite get the economics right, but it's still one of the metals they're looking at and using for this, in this regard. Now, we've got, we've got 48 metals we follow. Every one of those metals has a story like that or better. You know, South Africa controls the ruthenium market. Here's one they don't control. This is a homegrown, homegrown Australian industry waiting to be born. It has a very bad reputation down here because it was promoted, uh, promoted badly. But this is a really, really neat metal. Scandium, which is in that little group of metals, is uh, scandium, uh, yttrium, titanium, oh, zirconium and titanium, that little foursome there does magic stuff. It is the most potent grain refining element known to man for alloys of aluminum. The most important thing is it, you put 98% aluminum and 2% scandium in an alloy, and what you have is something that has, it's more flexible, it's stronger, it has the best strength to weight ratio you can get out of aluminum, and most importantly at all, it changes the grain structure so that it can be welded without heat cracking. Now, any of you guys who have boats, have a tinny, you know that they weld the hell out of the, out of the seams on that when they weld it because they don't last. Well, the implications here are absolutely stunning. Airbus and Boeing are all over this. Um, Airbus wrote a paper a few years back. They think that using these master alloys, aluminum scandium alloys, can reduce the weight of their plane by as much as 10 to 12 percent, perhaps 15 percent. That is, that is an earthquake. That is a tectonic shift in the, in the industry. Stranger still, you look at a 747 or an A380 or any of these planes, they have as many as two million rivets. Two million rivets holding that aluminum skin on the, on the outside of the plane. Well, you can now tack that together and weld it. There won't be any, there will not be any rivets. And when you walk up to the side of an airplane, you can run your hand on it, you can feel it's just a little tiny bump. You wouldn't think it does much, but at 600 miles an hour, that creates a lot of turbulence. Just getting a smooth skin will increase the efficiency in flight by as much as 10%. Now, scandium, strangely enough, hold on, let me see if I can get, where is it? Well, I'll go back and find it for you on this thing so we can, here you go. Scandium is up in the top left. As you can see, this is not a, this is not a metal from, created by a supernova. This is something that just created in this, you know, from, from our, our solar processes, fusion, fusion. And in fact, scandium burning on the sun is what gives us natural daylight. All these new lighting that's coming out, whether it's, they've been using it on film sets for a long time to mimic natural daylight so they can recreate daylight on the set. Right now in Europe, they're using these same lighting structures to light football fields, so they don't have that harsh light. This is kind of a tertiary use as far as we're concerned. The aluminum for the airline industry is gonna be huge, but with everybody being as green as you can get, there's also a massive green application. A company in California called Bloom Oxide makes a device called the Bloom Box. It's widely considered to be the most efficient solid oxide fuel cell on the planet. Their electrolyte is an yttrium-doped zirconium. Well, they've got, last time I checked 12 patents, it's probably more than that now. They found out that if you replace yttrium with zirconium, 
you reduce the operating temperature of the fuel cell. This means that you do not have to use all these specialty alloys to build the casing. It also, lower operating temperature, extends the life of the product. Now, bloom boxes are everywhere. Google them. They're, they're actually pretty cool. They're pretty cool. But scandium, they are just now starting to look at. The demand has been there for a long, long time, but there has not been any scandium. It occurs all over the planet in very low concentrations. And this, I added this down here at the bottom. The closest analog to the potential for scandium here, and this is the reason we're kind of dumbfounded that people aren't more hot to trot about this, is that the, the closest analog we can find for this is niobium. Now, up until 1970, niobium was a, essentially a byproduct of tantalum production. It was, almost, it was almost exclusively used in the aerospace industry because it made steel lighter and stronger. But it was always a byproduct, and there wasn't much around. So almost all of it went there. It was insanely priced. Well, 1969, 1970, the Brazilians found a porphyry deposit in, in Brazil. About six months later, the Canadians found one up in the Sudbury. Brazilians bought the Canadians. Now they have a five to seven million billion dollar a year monopoly. This is what we're talking about. Right now, they don't even use niobium in aerospace anymore. It's used to lighten automobile frames. We have the same type of thing setting up with scandium. Now, people have known and loved scandium. You, you Google scandium, you start looking at scandium. I can hand you 50 pages of research on scandium about what you can do with it and how cool it is. But there's never been any supply. Global supply runs usually between two and 10 tons per year. Even for the specialty metal market, that's very small. You know, even tellurium is 105, uh, 105 tons a year. Selenium is about 250 tons a year. You get up to indium, you're all the way up to 500 tons a year. So we're very, very small, very, very small amounts. Currently, it's about eight tons a year. We just use that. It is all as a byproduct, almost always of rare earth elements. The exception being ex-Soviet stockpiles, where their command economy said, well, we need scandium to make good aluminum to compete with them Yanks. And price was not an issue. And so they went into the uranium tailings and they produced lots of scandium. We don't know how much is left. The aerospace industry wants to see 300 tons a year of scandium production before they will retool and start making these alloys. Bloom Energy alone wants 30 tons. These are impossible figures for the market as it exists. There's your prices. This is, <laughs> price isn't really kind of incidental here. But Australia has three deposits now that are all economic. There's a, <laughs> there's a company that's listed on the, on the Toronto exchange called DNI Metals, a polymetallic metal. And one of the metals they list as being economic is scandium at nine gram per tons. You guys have nickel laterite deposits, two up in Queensland, at least two here in New South Wales, and who knows how many more. The Metallica deposit is 130 grams per ton. The Gervois is 261, and the Platinas is 340 grams per ton. These are economic numbers. The scandium can be recovered. It is being recovered. It has been demonstrated to be able to be recovered. Metallica is making press releases about this all the time. They can run it through an HPAL plant with their nickel and cobalt and make it economic. The Chinese demonstrated it a year and a half ago. The Chinese had a big announcement, really shook the market a year and a half ago. They said, God, we got a deposit with 40 grams per ton. Well, look what you guys have. The market wants to see 300 tons a year before they make a shift. Well, with a 90% recovery rate, you guys can produce at least 390 tons of metal or 630 tons per annum of scandium oxide. And that's a 20-year production horizon, and that is with absolutely no further exploration success. And I'll bet you anything you're going to find a lot more. Now, the specialty metal market, this is a good lead into why isn't Metallica's stock at $5? Why isn't Platina at $3 or $4? 
Why isn't, well, Javoris has got 18 billion shares, so why aren't they 50 cents? But my point is, the market gives, has no confidence whatsoever in any of this stuff ever being produced. And especially for the last, what, since about this time last year, all the commodity prices seem to peak, specialty metals, anything in specialty metal bracket, because it is so hard to finance these projects, they've just been killed. You can buy Metallica right now for about 50% less than its MPV. You can buy Platina for, oh man, I'm running out of time. You can buy Platina for pennies. These are strategic investments. Very important strategic investments. There's a, it's, it's a real cliche. People say you're the Saudi Arabia of this or the Saudi Arabia of that. Well, you guys really are the Saudi Arabia of Scandium. This is going to be a very important metal in the future. And it's going to happen. Nothing is going to stop this from happening. It never, ever gets stopped. It's just how long it's going to be slowed down for. I own all three of those, by the way. So why is this bull market so hard to find? Well, there is a lot of myths and disinformation in the market. The prices that producers pay for specialty markets are a trade secret. So when you call up uh, any, of these, any of these companies, or you read a quoted price for you know, selenium or, or ruthenium, they're pulling a number out of a hat. They got no clue what the real price is. Because that is a very important trade secret between that producer and that, uh, that guy who's going to use the scandium or the metal and that miner. So it's, it's very difficult. The murking is a, is a gross exaggeration. It's about as clear as mud. These projects are very hard to finance. Because from a commercial point of view, you can't hedge them. So in the case of Metallica, who has, who has announced they're going to try and get a, an HPAL plant funded, well, they're going to be able to hedge their nickel and cobalt, but they can't hedge their scandium, and yet scandium is going to be one of the major drivers on their profitability. Um, I've already mentioned this. Uh, as a byproduct, a lot of these things are sold forward. You need to look no further than silver. Right? Silver's been sold forward for so long, you know, it's just scary. Everybody knows that story. Pricing is discovery driven. Again, an important geopolitical thing that actually at the symposium two years ago, the gold symposium two years ago, when I talked about specialty metals of the first dime down here, I said, I predicted that China was going to go to the, the World Trade Organization for their behavior with these metals. At the time, we were talking just about rare earth elements, but I said right then, no, there's going to be other metals because they also control antimony, they also control graphite, they also control tungsten. You can go right through a list of 14 metals that they, they control more than 80% of the world production of. These things, this is such an important aspect of the economy. Nobody has a clue about how to get them, how to process them, or how to secure your supply lines. And this is coming. Now, of course, on top of everything else, now we've got problems in Europe. We have serious problems in the United States I'm going to talk about in a second. And we have very significant problems in Japan, which you'll see here in a minute. The BRICS, why they were added to South Africa is a mystery to me, but the BRICS are slowing. That's probably a nice euphemism for who knows what's really going on over there. Um, I'm running out of time here. I want to blaze. So this is just some uses for these electronics things, and the part that was most important is gone anyway. Um, so we'll just go here. Well, we went too far. I would like you to take a second and look at these concentrations. Metals are infinitely recyclable. Your cell phone, depending on what brand it is and how sophisticated it is, is going to have somewhere between 30 and 65 specialty metals in it. Look at the rate we're throwing this stuff away. Your old laptop computer is going to have at least 30 or 40 specialty metals in it. Your old, your old uh, Desktop, I don't even remember that phrase anymore. The same. We are just throwing them away. This is criminal. We live in a world where everybody wants to be green. We live in a world where everybody wants to uh, think about sustainability. And yet these metals, which are so finite and so few, we're just pissing away. This data is from 2010. I'm sorry, I didn't have a chance to get it updated. The United States throws away 123,000 computers a day. 
We throw away 400,000 cell phones a day. How many are recycled? Well, 19% are recycled for computers and 13% are recycled for cell phones. That sounds like a good start. The problem is 95% of the recovery value is found in four metals, gold, silver, palladium, and copper. So the other metals are just thrown away. Now, to their credit, to their credit, UMICOR is working very diligently on recovering these things. They're up to 14 metals they can recover now. But they're just barely breaking even because they're losing, metal, losing money on some of these metals to recover them. There has to be a concerted effort or we're going to lose all of these materials, all these specialty metals. This is, you know, this is very serious. I mean, we're not just talking about you know, running out of coal or, or natural gas. We're talking about things that aren't even from our galaxy. I mean, they aren't even from our solar system that took eons to concentrate. They are some of the most wonderful materials on the planet, and we're pissing them away. There's no excuse for it. I'm going to end of lecture. Another big, another big driver we've got coming here is actually what's going on in the US. Now, we've had uh, Claire gave a great talk on fracking um, and, and all the communication aspect of it and everything. We've done a lot of research on, on oil and gas. We, we, I would like to draw your attention to the third point there. The internet is giving us so much mis and disinformation, you don't know who to believe anymore. Peak oil is an extraordinary feat of prediction by Hubbard. It was a great, excellent piece of modeling. And it worked not only for an oil field, it worked for a whole bunch of conventional oil fields. But since 1980, we've nearly doubled the amount of oil we have because those nasty capitalists, they went offshore. They went deep offshore. They went to the tar sands. Now they've gone to shale. And there's a lot of oil. There's a tremendous amount. However, to give the, you know, to nod to the green, you know, the green movement, there is no doubt whatsoever that the mining of tar sands is an ugly affair. But I would give you it's not all that much uglier than the super pit. More importantly, and what the green agenda does not promote, is that more than 50% of the oil, oil that is withdrawn from the oil sands these days does not come from mining operations. It comes from in situ recovery. Another bit of very clever technology where they drill down into an oil seam, run two pipes parallel to each other, inject steam from the top one to heat up the oil in situ, and then they suck it out. There's no hole in the ground. There's no remediation. It gets overgrown almost overnight. It's beautiful. The next generation in this movement, in, in this technology, is they are now embedding catalysts in the, 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 the withdrawal pipe. So it's getting processed in situ at these temperatures, you know, 600 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the lowest temperature possible to start putting in some reforming catalysts. So they're doing some of that in line. Now, the Canadians can't buy a brick. They can't buy a brick. It's, it's, it's actually too bad. How many people in here know who America's biggest oil supplier is? Who? Canada. It is Canada. It has been Canada for a long time. Saudi Arabia falls in and out of the top five. Interestingly, how many people in here know that Hugo Chavez and his hatred of America he is always either our second or our third largest supplier of oil. Do you know why? His oil is so heavy and so ugly and so sulfur ridden that no one can process it. So Americans just, they absolutely and utterly disregard Hugo Chavez because he's marginalized himself with what he's doing. He nationalized old plants, old refineries that didn't have the capabilities to actually make him be able to pick up his own industry. He's alienated everybody through nationalization. He's really proud of the fact that uh, you know, the Chinese are going to take 50,000 barrels a day and learn to do that, what the Americans have been doing forever. Guys, get a grip. Everybody thinks about America being a technological company, or country. That's absolutely right, but it's not just computers and software. 
We know oil and gas better than anybody. There's a great three-dimensional great three-dimensional picture of oil wells and the United States looks like a pin cushion. There have been more wells drilled in Texas than in the rest of the world alone. We develop 3D technology, we develop all this stuff. The oil industry is a very sophisticated technology investment. It's one of the reasons it's so expensive. So we've got, you know, the U.S. just became the world's biggest gas producer. We're now number three on the oil list. The shales, you know, I included this one trillion dollar uh, estimate because I saw one that was 1.8 and one that was 0.8. So I took the middle one. You know, you choose which one you want to believe. But there's a lot of it there. We're demonstrating it's, it's, <laughs> it's infinitely recoverable. And it's going to go everywhere. So what's happened? This is the pear trade of the decade. We recommended this in our, in our report in 2008. You buy American chemical companies and fertilizer makers and you sell everybody else. There are people who made their whole career on that trade and it's still going. I hope you can read these numbers. The United States has, this is as of the end of 2009, and this is from the BTS, the Bureau of Transportation Services. The United States has 148,000 miles of crude and product pipelines. This does not include the pipelining of gasoline or ethanol. We have 321,000 miles of transmission and gathering pipeline for natural gas. That does not include the distribution stuff. That's more than one and a half million miles of distribution pipeline in the United States. Those things are color coded by their capacity. That's the good news. We have the infrastructure to be able to develop the shale gas. That's great. The bad news, it's well past its use by date. But wait, there's more. Yep. Gasoline consumption in the United States has fallen off a cliff. We can, run, we can read those on your own, but the, the bottom line is, for the first time in a long time, they're closing refineries in the United States, closing lots of them. They're not replacing them with new ones, they're just closing them, all up and down the eastern seaboard. They've closed four or five refineries. That has sustained the price of gasoline. In America, who is, despite you know, our rehabilitation with how much we drive, we still consume a hell of a lot of gasoline. And that is a de facto tax on the people. That's all this is showing us. This is a very interesting chart. At the end of, at the end of 1999, they did a poll for engineers in the world. And they said, what was the single technological innovation of the 20th century? What was the single best innovation? Well, people, you know, airplane, internet, telephone, satellite. The, United, the North American electrical grid was voted the technological achievement of the century. And it has been used and abused since they deregulated it. The system was not designed to ship wholesale amounts of electricity transcontinental. And the situation just got worse with the unintended consequence, albeit with the best of intention. See the increase in failures. These are NERC events. We are breaking our grid because we are dumping too much intermittent energy sources on it. That's the bad news. The other bad news is it's old and it needs to, large, large swathes of it need to be replaced. Good news is it's going to be replaced, it's going to incorporate energy storage on these things, whether it's going to be something like a vanadium redox battery or these new molten batteries that a guy from MIT developed. Let me race through here because I want to get to what's important. Uh, this is inflation prices. This is where I wanted to end with. How stable is this? Read this for yourself. This is all true. Since 1980, the United States has created 160,000 laws, but only repealed 79.
the longest book ever written, and they write it every year. It's the tax code. The number of federal employees has doubled in the last 10 years. That's the growth you're seeing in employment. They're all going to work for the government. But the strange thing is, it takes the tax receipt of 14 average Americans to pay the salary of one federal worker. Who's working for who? And this last one, this just came out in March. Regulations in general add $10,585 in cost per employee per year. How many people are going to hire into that? So, I'll skip through this stuff, you all know that. I love this though. Only in America could the rich people who pay 86% of all income taxes be accused of not paying their fair share by people who don't pay any income taxes at all. Mr. Uh, what's John's last name? Uh, Anderson said it was 46% of Americans don't pay federal income taxes. That's wrong. It's 52%. 56% of Americans are on some form of dull from the government. We've had a war on poverty. We've had, well, actually, I have to go back and show that. We've got to finish up. Okay. Anyway, this is Obama's slogan. My company specializes in picking up on trends. Okay? It is, it is wonderful that the United States elected a black man. It is brilliant. We're very pleased with that. Unfortunately, he has not delivered. Reform is in the air. When you get to a situation in the United States, we've had three prior reform movements. And what happened in each, in, in each case was you had the extreme left marching by the extreme right saying exactly the same thing, but in their codified languages. That is always an indication of change on the horizon. The United States has not had a reform movement, an antitrust action of any significance for almost a hundred years. We're overdue. And the movement is going to be towards smaller, less intrusive government. We don't need more laws. The global financial crisis would not have happened had they enforced the laws that were in place. So, I was going to let you ask me questions, but we're done. We're so, done. We're sorry. Be done. I'm sorry. Thank Please you very much. Richard Kahn. Sorry, sorry Richard, that's all right. No.